Hausman, and welcome to Shit They Don't Tell You on Sunday, a podcast to dig deeper into aspects of the Bible that get glossed over or totally ignored in most preaching. The Bible has a lot of parts that are racy, uncomfortable, and sometimes downright horrifying. Let's talk about it. Well, everybody, welcome to episode eight. Um, yeah, so our guest for today is the wonderful Pastor Chris Schaefer. Thank you. Who is the pastor at Divinity Lutheran Church in Towson, Maryland, which is, again, very close to Baltimore, which is why he is in, Here. in my, in my <laughs> home, um, in our home office. Yes. Um, which I, you know, like we have um, a queen in our home and her name is Adele Atkins as we give tribute to her here, mm. um, as well as our Adele prayer candle. Mother's looking over In us. case you thought we had Mother Mary, you're wrong. No. It's Adele. Lots of mothers. Mm-hmm. Right next to Michelle Obama. Yeah. <laughs> Mother. Just keep them all in the same place. That's right. Okay. Um, so this week we are diving into, I meant to write down, it's Trinity Sunday, which is May 30th? Correct. Yes. Yes. I always forget these things. <laughs> um, and everybody's like, well, don't you go to church every Sunday? How do you forget when they are? And it's like, you make valid points. But it's like, true. <laughs> when you're trying to manage multiple Sundays at once. That's, that's real. Yeah, that's, that's real. Mm -hmm. Anyways, um, so we're still in the Gospel of John, everybody. Yeah, we are. Love it. <laughs> um, I believe this is the last week of the Gospel of John. Yeah, I know a lot of people are bitter uh, when it comes to this year because um, uh, people who love Mark feel like John is, like, encroaching into his <laughs> time. And I'm like, listen, I think there's some good stuff in John. Um, he's mystic, he's weird, and I love him. So, um, my, like, uh, my pericope, my, my text or Bible study that pastors do every week, I have one that um, was some seminary classmates. Um, and that was pretty much like, what are you going to preach about? I don't know. What are you going to preach about? I don't know. What are you going to preach about? I'm really tired of preaching about love. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's great. <laughs> and, you know, it's akin to like when we get the summer of bread. Uh, yes. So, uh, yeah, John, John has like two themes and mm. like they just really drive it home. I love bread. Oh, yeah. John's kind of like Oprah. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so um, we have a, um, a fun text from the Gospel of John that I'm sure all of you are familiar with at least part of it, because it is probably the most overused yes. um, sentence in the entire Bible. Amen. <laughs> um, which, you know, as we've talked about before, is a huge problem when we, like, use those one sentences. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully uh, Chris and I are going to talk a little bit about what that sentence means in its yeah. actual kind of setting um, and, and what that means for us. So um, Chris is going to read for us today. Oh, and you guys will be proud of me. I took that extra step and went to the Common English Bible rather than just copy and pasting the New Revised Standard Version <laughs> from Sundays and Seasons. There are different versions. So we're reading from a different Bible today. Yes. This is from the Common English Bible, which is copyright 2011. Mm. Um, uh, I mean, personally, I only read from King James, uh, uh, but that's only because King James was queer. So, right. yeah. Um, so, John 3, 1 through 17 from the Common English Bible. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a Jewish leader. He came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could do these miraculous signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born anew, it's not possible to see God's kingdom. Nicodemus asked, How is it possible for an adult to be born? It's impossible to enter the mother's womb for a second time and be born, isn't it? Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't be surprised that I said to you, you all must be born anew. God's Spirit blows wherever she wishes. You hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. And it's the same with everyone who is born of the Spirit. 
Nicodemus said, how are these things possible? Jesus answered, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? I assure you that we speak about what we know and testify about what we have seen, but you don't receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the human one. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the human one be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Mm. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Oh. So, uh, <laughs> you gotta be careful, the wall is closer than it They'll jump out and get you. <laughs> okay, so, so, um, did you guys hear the, that one phrase? It might have been a little bit different in the common English Bible. Would you, would you read for us John 3.16? Absolutely. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, a. That's one I'm sure everyone has, has heard before. Uh, if you have been to any sporting event, um, <laughs> uh, if you have ever watched a sporting event, uh, if you have ever been to any sort of public uh, affair, it's probably there somewhere on a sign. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I actually, I don't think I would have realized that, like, with sporting events, this oh. is the one they single out. It's the big one, and I think for a lot of folks, it is so big because... Um, there are a number of theologians who have said and claimed that this is essentially like the gospel in a nutshell, right? Like, this right. is the good news, um, and if we only have, like, five seconds on a jumbotron to get people's attention, <laughs> right? Like, let's do this. This is the Christian um, elevator speech. Right, precisely, right? Um, and so even though, like... We who have, like, been in the church for some time might think, well, that's a little simplistic, um, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, I guess if you only have a few moments and you're just trying to be like, God loves you, and God loves you so much, and this is why God did what God did, um, I can kind of get it. Uh, that being said, <laughs> uh, I still do think that there's a lot more to it and there's a lot more around it. Oh, yeah. And I think for me, I, I struggle with um, putting it in... I, I just struggle with this particular verse because of, again, how it's taken yeah. and how it's used yep. and how it's made um, sort of a, a gatekeeping thing, right? That, Absolutely. That, like, clearly, if you don't believe the right way or do the right thing... Um, as we have here, be born anew, or in the King James uh, Bible, mm. ye must be born again. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, oh, the King James Bible. Oh, King James. Would you please share with us a little bit about the King James Bible? Oh, absolutely. Because so, one thing we've talked about is like, um, you know, keeping things in its context really matters, yes. and that like, understanding that in our English translation, that this has been translated from Greek and Hebrew, and sometimes it's been translated into another language yes. before it even got to English. And so to understand that, like, it's important, it's important to understand that, like, a game of telephone has happened yes. a little bit. And, and here's something that's really important to understand is that the person who translated it has their own lens, right? And so their lens comes out in how it's translated. Amen. Absolutely. Um, and, and the King James Version is a good example of that. Absolutely. And so it wasn't written by King James. Um, uh, it was merely sponsored by King James. He commissioned it. He did. Uh, and King James was a king, uh, indeed. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's good to be the king, uh, <laughs> according to Mel Brooks at least. And um, one of the advantages to being a king, uh, apparently, was that you could have just have tons of lovers. Yeah. Um, and King James loved lovers. Uh, the Gospel of John and him would have gone along very well. <laughs> um, but uh, his lovers um, uh, were of multiple genders. Um, and so uh, the church kept harassing him about it. And so, in order to get the church off of his right, back, like no one else cared. Like he had a, he yeah. was documented. He had like a secret 
like doorway to like he had a male lover who had their own room in the palace. Absolutely, yeah. and it, it was like not so secret. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, like poorly kept secret. Uh, and uh, so um, uh, part of his way of getting the church off of his back um, uh, was he was like, "Fine, church, I'll just give you tons of money." go, like, write a Bible, uh, and then, like, maybe you won't bother me about, like, this male lover who lives over here. Mm -hmm. Um, and so King James himself, um, not necessarily who we might associate with, uh, some of the writings and theology that has come out of the King James Bible. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I might start bringing back Verily and <laughs> Val, uh, uh, just if I want to be fancy, but, um, uh, I do appreciate the, the common English Bible um, for kind of trying to bring some newer language into it, at least. Right, so this is so this is why I, like, every week I just read out of the New Revised Standard Version. Yep. Because that's what's on Sundays and seasons. Yeah, that is true. Um, and I think almost every week my guest has been like, well, in the common English Bible it says this. <laughs> Folks love it. I mean, I, I feel like Greg gets to know everyone's more uh -huh. progressive than I am. Oh, Bible readings listen. With their nice 2011 <laughs> version, I'm still reading the 1989 version. Oh, how passe. So um, listen, the 80s are totally coming back, and I think <laughs> the NRSV is going to as well. Um, because sometimes I do think the NRSV, in my perspective at least, again, like you're saying, everybody comes at it with their own lens, their own perspective. Everybody has their own personal worldview, their own personal um, history their own lens through which they view the world and yeah. how they view the Bible and theology. And that impacts translation, right? Like the well, words really do matter a lot so of So that is a, that's a tough concept for some people. Like some people don't understand how we do have different theologies, like how we can, we can yeah. view things differently. Oh, mm-hmm. And I mean, so there's a big part of like, like, but it says this, so that's what right. it's like, but so, it's true. Right. And so, yeah, and I, so I mean, the CEV, I like it uh, because it does, um, it's a bit more understandable perhaps and accessible, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that like it's always going to nail it 100%, yeah. right? Um, uh, there's usually committees that come together to write these Bibles, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, interdenominational, usually interfaith. As oh, well. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so they try to get the context, they try to get, you know, the language context, the historical context, the social context. Um, and so it does really uh, have a lot of significance in terms of how these words come out, right? And so, again, when we're talking about, you know, the like King James being queer, for example, um, uh, right, the, a lot of stuff that comes out of queer theology, um, uh, one of the big uh, uh, pieces um, uh, that we look at a lot in queer theology, um, uh, I am gay, by the way, um, uh, for our listeners here, <laughs> just FYI, um, uh, 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 is that, um, uh, right, the word uh, that's often translated as homosexual didn't actually show up in the Bibles until the 1940s. Correct. Right. Um, a really good, oh, what is that book? There's a really good book that talks about that. It's like Reclaiming Sodom or something like that. Mm -hmm. That really talks about that, about when and how the Bible became homosexualized. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Crossing the Bridges Canon is another, uh, Canyon is another good one. Uh, Matthew Vines has a lot of stuff, right? Um, and, uh, but just to, just to understand that for those that are like, we're all going to Bible says, so I'm like, yeah. well, let's talk about the history of that a little bit. The, like, that didn't always exist in the languages there. The translation to using that language mm -hmm. against queer people was intentional. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And in that, pati that uh, particular example, the word that is used is a slang that, like, Paul just kind of used, and we're not entirely sure what it means. But up until the 40s, when um, homosexuality started getting criminalized in mm -hmm. a lot of countries, um, it was translated as child molester. Um, and so because there were, uh, I mean, not to go down this huge rabbit hole, but, um, we'll, we're already a little down in the dirt. Um, so, uh, but it was kind of like, uh, started to see it as this kind of psychiatric condition, right? Like that to be LGBTQ plus was, uh, to have a mental health condition. It was a disorder. Um, and so it got associated with some others. Um, and so they were like, well, you know, it's kind of like child molester, uh, so we'll just put it together. 
Uh, right, so there's I a, know, we know, don't have time to unpack all of that. Uh, <laughs> That'll be another podcast. We'll have you come back. For sure. Joe Cat, just for unpacking oh, right. all that. Right, yes, but back to John. Yes. Back to John. Um, so one thing with, like, the Common English Bible um, and, and the little bit more progressive language in here is you have the term the human one. Um, and if you use another Bible, a translation of that phrase that you may be more familiar with is son of man. Um, and it literally has to do with a descendant of humanity. So uh, descendant of humankind is actually probably the most accurate translation of that. Um, and that really has to do with understanding that like Jesus was fully divine and fully human. Um, and so it's, it's really kind of bringing those two, two things together there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so that just is a, is a, you know, translation decision. But and Nicodemus! So Oh yeah, well, and I was also say that's oh, a term. Sorry. No, that's fine. Uh, that's a term that is also comes out of a vision that Daniel had um, in Hebrew scriptures, and so that's another way, uh, another reason why Jesus kind of claims it is like, I'm the one that like was foretold right. essentially, right? Um, uh, but yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. This uh, the the human one, um, mm -hmm. uh, I think, speaks to that. But yeah. Nicodemus, yes. So Nicodemus. So um, as we said, you know, I just got to put things in context. So this is coming. Um, John three here is. Um, so Jesus is in Jerusalem uh, for the Passover, and I believe it's just before the Passover. It's right after in the Gospel of John where Jesus comes in and throws a temple tantrum mm. and uh, cleanses uh, the the temple. And, how? and so yeah, so like he's getting all, everyone everyone saw this or heard about it, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. it's making the gossip rounds. Hot gossip. Yeah. Yes. So who is this guy doing these things? Um, and so, uh, a person that heard about it is this guy, Nicodemus. So, uh, Nicodemus is a Pharisee, um, and he is in the Sanhedrin. So it says Jewish leader here, which another one, it, it, meaning, um, the word archon is, um, ruler, governor, um, and just like a proper title for, uh, a Sanhedrin elder. Yeah, so like the, the big Jewish council, essentially, no. right? They're he's a big wig. Oh yeah, he's, he's a big one. So like, Pharisees were already revered um, uh, in their culture, in their communities, as um, folks who were super righteous. They knew a lot. And Pharisee is just a type of Jewish. Absolutely, it's, it's yeah, a it's a sect of Judaism, right? Yeah. Like, you might be familiar with like Sadducees, Pharisees. A lot of times they're kind of portrayed as... Like, we're Lutheran. Yeah, right, yeah. It's like a denomination sort of a thing, right? Um, uh, but... That, yeah, um, <laughs> in a little bit of a different way, but, uh, but yeah, and so Pharisees, uh, they were regarded as very righteous, very upstanding individuals in their communities because they knew a lot, they were very well educated, especially about Jewish customs, Jewish law, um, and uh, they were uh, revered as like good people who did the right things, who knew the right things, um, and uh, what's interesting, they're, they're often portrayed as kind of like these enemies against Jesus, right? That they're the ones that, that kind of come up against him because they, you know, felt that, like, some of the things that Jesus was saying and doing weren't, like, exactly by the book, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I think it's interesting because a lot of biblical scholars that I've read actually um, feel that Jesus himself probably was a Pharisee. Um, or if not, if he didn't self-identify, he would have at least been widely regarded as someone who was a Pharisee because he had all of this knowledge and was, you know, viewed to be so righteous and knew all the scriptures um, that even if he himself didn't self-identify as a Pharisee, others would have re regarded him as such. He's not really a rule follower, though. It's true, right? <laughs> um, uh, but, like, he knew the rule. Right, he did, and so right. that's why multiple times when people are coming at him, right. he's like, yeah. nah, brah, um, yeah. let me tell you. Yeah, 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 uh-huh. But so this was, um, so this was your ordination gospel. This was, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And tell me why, it's about, it's about Nicodemus, right? Yeah, and so Nicodemus is kind of like this, you know, random character in a lot of ways. He really only shows up one other time in scripture, um, and it's- Twice. Uh, Which one because I Googled it. Oh, well, right. Uh, so and by Googled, you know, I, I do my homework. Of course, of course. Well, it's only in the Gospel of John, and only? he appears two more times. Right. So one other main time, I should say. Yes. Um, he's kind of like a footnote in one other reference. Um, uh, but the main other time that he shows up is actually after Jesus has died. Um, and uh, he is um, uh, wants to take care of Jesus' body. Um, right? And so I, I always just think it's really interesting... Um, you know, if I'm, like, writing Bible fanfic, uh, to think about, like, what happened in between, like, 
this uh, midnight encounter and uh, Do you think that's really just what preaching is, is Bible fan fiction? <laughs> <laughs> I mean That's all pastors do for is me, write Bible maybe. fan fiction. Yes, <laughs> absolutely, right? Um <laughs> And it's not that, I mean, and the thing about fanfic is, like, it's not like I'm making it up or just, like, you know, putting well, whatever, it, some of it, maybe. <laughs> but, like, but in this case, you know, I think that we can use context clues to say, you know, that there are, are things going on outside of what we just read about, right? Yeah. That, like, this didn't exist in a vacuum, essentially. Um, and so, uh, and so, yeah, in a lot of ways, Nicodemus might get kind of written off as... This sort of side character, right? Um, kind of like a minor player in in the Jesus narrative. Um, but I love this text. For me, at least, I think there's just something so beautiful and holy and mysterious about someone sneaking out in the middle of the night because there was something that drew him in. Yeah. Right? There was something he couldn't necessarily pin it down, like. He had heard about Jesus, right? Like, knew where there's some things going about. Obviously, he had an understanding because it's like, I, you know, I know all these miraculous signs you've been doing. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, he has knowledge about Jesus. Um, and uh, there's something that intrigues him. He wants to know more. Like, what's your deal, man? Like, what's your story? And you know? want someone, like, in high school sneaking out in the middle of the night to, like, go meet up with a... a well, boyfriend? right. Well, and so yeah. for me, I think there's part... That, that didn't get to happen where I was like, we live in the middle of nowhere. So well, like, first of all, I couldn't go anywhere. I mean, same, same. But in a lot of the movies I watched yeah, back exactly. in high school, um, uh, I probably had this kind of romanticization about, like, the midnight conversation just because, a, a, for the most part, a lot of these late night conversations that I have had, um, there's something holy and beautiful about them for me, right? Yeah, like there's I something agree. intriguing. Yeah. They're, they're ones that stick with me for some reason. Um, I don't know what it is, but like there, there's just something, I guess, in that type of atmosphere that is just like, this is different. This is special, yeah. right? This is unique. Um, and, um, uh, and I mean, honestly, there's a little bit of danger and risk in this for Nicodemus too, right? I mean, being a member of the Sanhedrin, right? If he's a bigwig in the Jewish communities, and he is seen, like, going out to, like, have a midnight combo with Jesus? Like, yeah. a scandalo, right? Um, uh, so, you're actually addressing one of my issues with Nicodemus. Tell me all about it. Um, so, Nicodemus appears three times in the Gospel of John. Here, when he approaches Jesus at midnight, you know, really curious about his, his whole deal. Mm -hmm. um, we see him a little bit later. So, the next time Jesus goes to Jerusalem is for uh, another festival, um, Sukkot. Mm -hmm. um, and right after that is, is when they're, like, really coming at Jesus. And he actually defends... Jesus to the rest of the Sanhedrin. Oh, yes, 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 Just yes. Pointing yes. out that, like, mm -hmm. you know, we don't we don't do this. We right. don't judge people without trial, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because, um, again, like, this is also, I, I want to be clear, too, when we hear, like, this this Jewish leading leader body, right, Jewish elders, um, this is, this, yes, it's a church body, but it is also a governmental body. Oh, 100%. Like, the, the Sanhedrin has, like, power to put people in prison, power to put people to death, like, they have, like, they, th this is a power. And so what happens there is a few people want to go at Jesus for whatever scandalous thing he does at Sukkot. Um, and Nicodemus is like, no, that's not how this works. Um, you know, we don't judge people without a fair trial. Like, yeah. that's how the system works. Yeah. And then we don't hear from Nicodemus again until after Jesus is dead. Mm -hmm. And so here <laughs> is my big problem with Nicodemus. Push it back, yes. As a person with authority and power. Yeah. Particularly a person, a part of the authoritating body that put Jesus to death. Yeah. Where was he? Right. If he's on board with this, which I mean, like, technically at the end of his conversation with Jesus, we don't necessarily find out that, you know, he's a follower of Jesus now. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say that. But, right. like, you get that impression, though, especially, like, how he defends Jesus and, thou, and then how he's one of the only people that comes and, like anoints Jesus and buries him yeah. with the Jewish ceremony, right? So, like, clearly he cared about him. Yeah. So, where the hell was he? Right. Right? So, all I hear is some man with power mm -hmm. being complicit. Yes. Um, all those things. So, listen, <laughs> I'm not trying to hold, uphold Nicodemus as some sort of perfect, right? Um, and, I mean, again, I could go in a rabbit hole about the word perfect even, but, um, right, because, like, Nicodemus is human, 
you know? Um, uh, 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 and so certainly, I, I would imagine there's times when he's not going to do everything 100%. Right. Um, there's also, I think... Uh, but it's a silence, right? Like, and I say that because yeah. like, this is a thing that we talk about all the time right now. Right. Like, you have a power to be silent. Absolutely. Oh, so yeah. I... Um, it was on my internship. It was a, a couple years ago. So it was... Uh, it was World Pride Year, and I'm just outside New York City. Like, I actually participated and was on a float in World Pride with a bunch of Lutheran bishops, which was really cool. Yeah. Um, and so it's leading up to, to, to the World Pride, right? And so it's it's that Sunday. Um, and it's nuts up there. Like, people are already coming <laughs> in from all over the world. Right. And, like, normally being on the subway is nuts. This was, like, oh. I didn't know that I was claustrophobic until that day. Yeah. Like, we, it was, uh -huh. was nuts. Like, yes. The city was, like... Not gay. as prepared. As it, it was. It was gay. It was, as RuPaul might say, yes. next level gay shit. It yes. was, um, which was also really interesting because I apparently have either I don't know if it's my face or or yeah. what, but people come up and just start talking to me. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. Um, you got vibes. My wife sometimes just walks away. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, "Why is it always you?" And I, I don't, yeah. Anyways. The week leading up to it, so we're at um, we're at our, our conference, um, Pericope, the, the the Bible study pastors uh -huh. every week, um, and another one of the there there was also another queer pastor in this group, and so he was talking about all of these wonderful things that they were going to do for their Pride service on Sunday, um, specifically you know like there was going to be a prayer, there was going to be some memorial with mm -hmm. it. Um, because, like, uh, let's be clear, the LGBT has a very, very high, um, let's see, uh, one suicide rate, but also yes. just de death rate in general, yep. Um, yep. disproportionately. Yep. Anyways, so there's a memorial piece with them, he was talking about all these things they were doing, um, and then I said something about, like, there was a piece that, like, I was going to talk about, like, like, in my sermon that Sunday, and everyone else was quiet. Yeah. Right? And so th this other pastor was like, well, wh what are you guys going to talk about? And everyone was like, yeah, I don't, you know, probably, you know, wasn't gonna, hadn't thought about it, mm -hmm. probably, you know, whatever. Right. Um, and this is where, like, I, I just lost a little bit, and I said, so here's the deal. Yeah. You have the privilege to be silent. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. Right? And so the fact that you have the privilege to either speak up for people right. or be silent I, to me, it's complicit yeah. by remaining silent. Yeah. Um, and it's the same thing with, with racism. Like, yep. we have the ability to be silent. Oh, yeah. But that, that is a privilege of being complicit. 100%. Anyway, yeah. so, like, I'm, I, this is where I struggle with Nicodemus. Yeah. Because he was a part of that system. Yeah. He had that power. Right. Where, where is he right. well, when the high priest is putting him to death? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so... In the same way that we don't hear anything from him, we don't hear anything about him, uh, right? And so, I, I'm hesitant to say that he didn't do anything. That being said, you would think if someone was sticking up for Jesus in the Sanhedrin, that, that like, that probably would <laughs> be somewhere. heard about right? it. Yeah, that might be written down somewhere. Yeah, um, and I don't know, so, so, so to think about, too, in, like... Not to totally, um, skewer Nicodemus here, um... <laughs> This is the Gospel of John, and he's only in the Gospel of John, and the Gospel of John has a very, very clear focus. Yeah. Um, and part of that is is that, you know, Jesus went willingly, that he was the sacrificial lamb, that he had to die. Right. Right? And so, like, the story is not so much, it, it's more about, it's, it's more about that divine purpose of it, rather than, like, the events themselves of what happened. Yeah. As it is in the synoptic gospels. Well, right. And so if that didn't really serve the author's purpose, um, right. or didn't serve the purposes of the folks who commissioned the authors, who were paying, you know, their yeah, salary, yeah, yeah. Uh, right? Um, uh, you know, it's possible Nicodemus is like, hey, if I give you a couple of draft months, can <laughs> you, like, you know, just sneak my name in there a few times? Um, but, like, yeah, it's a both and, right? I mean, I would love for there to be somebody to be... We love a good resistor story, right? I mean, we love a good hero that, like, stands up for good in the face of evil and, and adversity. Um, and I also fully understand the fear, right? I understand the self-preservation. Yeah. I understand why he's sneaking out in the middle of the night. Right. Like, uh, because there is a part, I think, that, like, where self-preservation comes in. Not that it, it absolves him 
by any means. Please understand, I'm not trying to say that. Yeah. But... Right. So they haven't announced it at this point in time, but by the time that we hear from Nicodemus again in, in like chapter seven, like they've already had the conversations that they want to kill him. Yeah, right? sure. And so I can understand where like Nicodemus could be like, ooh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. am I a minority here? Like, do I right. kind of, I, do I really have the power? Would all I be doing be condemning myself? I don't know. Yeah. I, maybe the moral takeaway is just that Nicodemus is an underdeveloped character. Well, and this is where I this is where I love Nicodemus is that like I want to know more about Nicodemus' yeah. story right like when we, from the glimpses that we get I'm curious right okay. there's something that draws me in about Nicodemus um, I I think so there's an apocryphal book that was written in like the 400s or something that has more about Nicodemus there usually is um, <laughs> <laughs> more fan fiction I love it that's probably really um, what the fan fiction of the Bible is the apocrypha right well. <laughs> Right, so... Or for the Catholics, it's just a part of the I Bible. I mean, right, yeah, it's just... <laughs> or as other some folks call it, the Bible. Um, <laughs> uh, but, like, but, yeah, and, and I, you know, also, St. Hedrian councils, like, weren't necessarily public meetings that were happening. So we don't know so what happened. We don't really know, right? Yeah, like, the, I mean, oh, you know, the... The, the poor church secretaries, uh, the council secretaries that have to take notes and everything. I can understand if there's someone, like, if no one in the Sanhedrin wanted that job, like, to take notes all the time. Maybe we didn't have them. I don't really know. Or they could have those, like, I feel like there are meetings out there that totally exist where, like, the off-the-record notes be like, right. and don't write yeah. this part yeah. down. Yeah, 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 yeah. right. And so it's a both um, and. And and I feel like, yes, we should have heard probably something if you did, and... I, you know, um, it's, uh, again, a, a privilege of us to be like, if I had been in that time and place, I would have Always. said something. Uh, so right? that's a good thing to, like, really think about and remember when we look into the Bible on these 2,000-year-old texts, like, <laughs> we have the privilege right. of a lot of, like, right, like, we know the rest of the stories, like, we know the ending, uh -huh. like that, yeah. uh, spoiler alert, yeah. we, we know what happens. <laughs> Um, and so it's really easy for us to put certain, like, judgments and stuff on that. Right. Um, one of which is the insertion of baptism into this text, Yay! actually. Yeah. Um, so when we look at this with our, our 21st uh, century perspective, like, we automatically hear being born again, yep. being baptized. Yes. Um, but that's not necessarily what they're, they're talking about. But I want to talk about this born again phrase, because this is, like... This is a tough one because mm. in American Christianity, um, for those that are, are in some sort of evangelical church, like they, they know a lot more about this. And then mm -hmm. those of us on the outside of that are like, oh my God, they're yeah. talking about it again. Yeah. Right. Um, because like, so there's this thing with this, with this born again, born again phrase, like it's been commandeered by, by evangelical churches and used, and I do say used. Oof used against people to, to keep God's gifts away from people. Um, it's been used to condemn, um, right? Like if you're not born again, if you're not in this, then you're yeah. not, you don't get any of the gifts, right? Um, and it's used to pressure and manipulate people into doing a lot of, into doing a lot of things that are really not very Christian at all. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing, mm -hmm. you know, when Jesus says that you need to be born from above, um, Jesus doesn't say, that you need to say the sinner's prayer and yeah. accept Jesus into your heart. Correct. Um, and that you'll go to heaven after you die. It's true. Because that's that distinction with that eternal life thing. Yeah. Um, which we, we talked about on another podcast. I don't remember which week it is, but we went deeper into the John and the eternal life thing mm -hmm. and the different, I think with Pastor Brad. Mm. Um, but, so let's just for argument's sake. Great. I'm going to use the evangelical word at this mm -hmm. English literary level that they uh -huh. like to use it at. Yep. This eternal life, this after you die thing that, right. that, they, that they point to, that you have to do these things yeah. in order. Yep. Um, because they'll say, they point to this text, and they say, listen, um, you're going to go to hell. Yeah. Very specifically. Uh -huh. It's not just that you don't... Uh, whatever. Uh, it's... <laughs> It's very, this is the other thing with, with evangelical Christianity. It's, it's black and white. There's never any room for, for gray area, which mm. is quite a problem because most of the Bible is a gray area <laughs> um, and contradicts itself quite a lot. <laughs> but anyways, so yeah. they have this like, you you have to do this, right? right. Like this, yep. if you want this thing, you must do this. Yeah. None of them, mm -hmm. <laughs> because Jesus said it, right? Like right, you, right. this is how you get to eternal life. You must do this. Yep. 
In the Gospel of Matthew, uh -huh. Jesus is asked again, like, how do you get eternal life? Yep. Do you know what Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew? Uh-huh. You gotta sell all of your things. Give it all away to the poor. Yeah. Uh-huh. I don't hear that being preached from evangelical churches. Oh, honey. I mean... <laughs> I think I hear a lot of, you need to give your money to us. Uh, right. Well, you know, uh, I think... Because if you want to know where the rich pastors are... Woo! Uh, there was a whole article that um, that came out, I think it was the New York Times recently, and mm -hmm. it compared a lot of big, like, evangelical charismatic pastors, and specifically right. someone was um, looking at their fashion. Yeah. Um, and all of these pastors wearing $500 shoes, $1,000 pants, you yeah. know, like, wow, like, wow, that's... Um, so people are giving their money to the church, right, that they're, they're manipulating you to, to you know, to, to do this, to give all your money to them, that they can fix you, they can offer you salvation, and they can do all these things. Yeah. And all you're really doing is padding away for them to wear $500 shoes. Yeah. I mean, that's ridiculous. It is. Um, uh, you will never see a Lutheran pastor wearing $500 <laughs> shoes. <laughs> Not in this denomination, at least. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean... Uh, I have borrowed the phrase, I take the Bible seriously, I don't take it literally, right? Um, because I think everything has a context, uh, and, uh, uh, and so to take this one verse... Well, taking it literally doesn't even make any sense if you think about, like, translation decisions and translation. Well, of like, course. It doesn't actually make any sense, because why would it, like... Maybe if I knew Greek really well... Yeah. And I could take the Greek at face value... Yeah. Well, I think... But then which version of it? Because think of all the transcript, right? right? What right. you also don't know is that there's not just, like, one holy transcript <laughs> of the Greek Bible that popped out of the yeah, sky, right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. there are, are several different ones that they have found, and that, like, even those manuscripts um, from different periods of time don't agree with each other on, on everything, right. especially the Hebrew Bible. Like, right. Well, I, you, you've got written translations coming out of oral tradition, right? Um, yes. And so, uh, again, it's telephone, right? Um... Uh, so, but what I mean to say by that is... Uh, so taking it, like... Yeah. Even if you take it seriously, though, right? Well, we're right, but I'm saying, that's what I'm saying, like, taking it literally, um, yeah. uh, actually is insane. Oh, it's bonkers. It's impossible. You literally can't take the Bible literally, right? Well, you but, can anyways, like, how right. much it contradicts itself, well, right? Well, like, precisely, and so that's the issue. One um, day you have to cut your arm off, and then the next day right. you're in the Oh, <laughs> man. It's, well, and so that's why, you know, the, uh, the Bible's clear. It says it in the Bible. Well, does it, though? Um, yeah. Uh, and so I think, again, when you're talking about... <laughs> the Bible is anything but clear. Anything. <laughs> um, but when you're talking about the gatekeeping that happens with, with 316, God so loved, right? Yeah. This is another huge example of the gatekeeping where it, if it fits with your understanding, your theology, right, like... You have to fit into my theology in mm -hmm. order to, uh, you know, to get these rewards. Um, uh, when there's a lot of other things happening here, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, um, and it doesn't even specifically say the word baptism, um, but it says in here, born of the water and the spirit. So there's a lot of folks that will jump right to, well, you're talking about baptism, obviously, right? Um, but again, if you want to talk about like literal, seriously, mm -hmm. this is the same issue Nicodemus is having. Um, uh, because he's coming uh, to Jesus and saying, okay, what's your deal? What's your story? Right? Um, uh, and Jesus is like, you can't get in heaven until you're born again. And he was like, well, that's not even what I was talking about. But, uh, but since we're on that subject, uh, I'm sorry. What? Um, uh, right? Like, yeah, you literally can't be born again. Uh, I'm not going to crawl up into my I'm mama's not... womb and then come out a second time. You literally want me to shove my head <laughs> right, back right, right. in? I'm mean, like... Uh, not only is that physically impossible, um, uh, I don't want that, um, uh, right? That, uh, all this to say, right? Like, I, what are you talking about? I can't be physically born again. And so Jesus goes on to say, well, okay, I'm not actually talking about the physical, mm -hmm. right? What's born of the flesh is flesh. What's born of spirit is spirit. Uh, and so I think that's a really, really important distinction here, um, especially in its, when it's combined in with 316 later, uh, right? When we're talking about who is in the kingdom of heaven, so to speak, who's allowed in, that's why you can't separate 16 from 17. Right. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> again, so in our, these manuscripts, these transcripts of, you know, old Greek and stuff like that. Yeah. Things such as chapter and verse yeah. didn't exist. Oh, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, not a thing. <laughs> that, that whole thing where, um, you know, we, we think, well, this verse on its 
phone is, is <laughs> it's not like that didn't exist. Somebody right. created that later and added those little numbers so that'd be easier us for, for easier us for to find to things. find. Yeah. That's the only reason that exists. Yeah. But it was never meant to be taken separately. Yeah. Um, which is to be said also with anything that we take out of this context in the Bible. It it was it was always meant to be a part of where it is. Yeah. Right. Like when you parse out like that's against what the author was doing with it. Right. Like that's us saying later because now these numbers exist that we can just pick and choose <laughs> right, right. which one we want yes. but yes so 16 and 17 were never meant to be severed from each other yep um and so 16 is really really important yeah and only makes sense and <laughs> with 17 so right. read us 16 and 17 again gladly so 16 god so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who and who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life 17 God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Yes. Right? And so this is why, you know... I I'm sorry, my evangelical Christians, <laughs> were we just here? <laughs> <laughs> that we're not supposed to, that God didn't send right. Jesus to right. judge? Uh-huh. Right. So, like, we're... This is also the part that gets me, is quite often is when, when you hear this gatekeeping language. Yeah. It's sort of like, who... Who are you getting that from? Because that's the exact opposite of anything Jesus ever did. Jesus right. was the opposite of a gatekeeper. Right. Like, Jesus crossed so many boundaries with people he sh never should have been. Like, I, where, where do we get off thinking that all of a sudden, oh, well, you ought to be born again or else right. you're not in the club. <laughs> I mean, there was that one time when Jesus said, I am the gate. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, but There's again, that. not gatekeeping as we think about it, right? Uh, essentially, was saying, like, I provided a way. This is where, where what I That's get from this thing. text, I right? Provided I have provided a way for you mm -hmm. because you can't do this on your own, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that's why I am here. This is why I am God incarnate. This is why God has like sent God's word into the world so that people could like internalize the word, be saved by the word, hear the word. Yeah. I am here. Because I am here for you and to make a path for you. Uh, and uh, so when it's talking about, like, you can't, um, you know, no one will get into, uh, uh, it's impossible to enter God's kingdom unless you're born of the water and the spirit. I don't think that's talking about, are you born again, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so if you want to talk about born again. A more accurate translation is born from above. Correct, right? So it's a, uh, there are tons of puns and double entendres all over the Bible. Um, uh, Jesus is really punny. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of that has been lost. It gets lost in English. I know, something lost in translation, this. Um, uh, so yeah, it's not even necessarily um, born again. It could also be translated as a born from above. Um, and again, if this is kind of, we're using a visual understanding of what the kingdom of heaven is. Again, we're fitting with the culture at the time. There's this cultural yeah. understanding that's above, that's God's kingdom, right. right? This is the divine reality, and this is the earthly kingdom. Um, and so when you are born of the spirit, um, I think that's God's action. I don't think that's ours, right? Yeah. Like, And so this gatekeeping thing of like, are you born again? Have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Like, Hi, 17 said, <laughs> right. I have provided a way for you. Um, uh, and uh, so it's not so much that I think you have to like check off these boxes in order to get through the pearly gates, mm -hmm. right? Like I just don't, for me at least, that is not God and the divine reality for me. That's right. not how I understand it. Um, and I think this is God's action on us. If you want to even say it's baptism, that's God's action on us. Mm -hmm. It's not because of our own, you know, good works or, you know, because we have done all the right things. We're obviously never going to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. This is why God sent the Son into the world. Because God loved the world so much. God loves us so much. God's like, I'm just going to come down and kind of, like, do the thing. I'm just going to take care of it. I'm just going to do it for you. Because, like, I love you so like much. So I realize you can't do it for you. <laughs> So um, something too with with this um, with the phrase here for save uh, sofe, which is a form of sozo. Yeah. Um, the the verb for save. Mm -hmm. um, it is an aorist subjunctive passive third person singular. Yeah, it is. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. I'm not gonna go into what all of that means because that's a whole other hour that nobody Ooh, here 
you got to take about. summer Greek for that. But yeah. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this thing about it being passive third person singular, though. And that third person singular uh -huh. is the cosmos. Uh -huh. So what that means is it's being, it's passive. There, yeah. Cosmos isn't doing it. It's being done, done to, to the us. cosmos. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and, and it's, and scan that. It's, it's the cosmos, the entire world. Yeah. Um, Jesus doesn't say, um, this is all so that God can save you born again Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus doesn't say it's all just for you individually, you the believer, or even you humans. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is the entire world. And you're not doing a damn thing about it. You are passive in this process. It no. is being yeah. done to you. Uh -huh. the same thing. <laughs> whether I mean, it's important. Whether you like it or yeah. not. <laughs> Yeah, right, so that God has already accomplished this, I think is the idea, right? That, like, because we can't save the world. Right. You know, and that's, and, for me... I don't really want to. Uh, oh, God, no, that sounds like a lot of work. I don't have time um, in my day for that. Oh, it's it. exhausting. Uh, I mean, how am I going <laughs> to binge the third season on Netflix? Um, uh, but, yeah, but it's also not within my capacity. Right. Even if I wanted to, I can't do this, right? Um... And so it's frustrating, I think. Well, so I think that's where, like, the, the, the mentality that I think of, like, uh, manipulating people yeah. and forcing them yeah. is I think you're putting people in, like, an impossible situation, right? Like, yeah. no, we can't accomplish this. We can't be perfect. Like, it just, we, we can't do it. Right. Yeah. And um, you're putting that kind of stress and anxiety on someone. Oh. Telling them that they have a, you know, damnation ahead of them. Right. They don't get their shit together. Right. That's just not how it works. Well, and so this is a huge part. So we are Lutherans, the two of us. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and um, uh, this is a huge thing that Luther had, his um, unfectung, right? Um, uh, he had these big... He always, he, I mean, <laughs> we're kinfolk. He, uh, he had anxiety disorder, just like <laughs> myself. Um, but, like, a big part of his triggers for his anxiety um, was he was like, I, I, I can never be sure. Have I done enough? Am I good enough? Have I been reborn enough, right, in order for God to love me and in order to get into heaven? And I'm like, sweetie, it's right here. <laughs> um, right? Like, no, you can't. And, yes, you will get into heaven, right? Like, yeah. I'm taking care of it. Um, and I think this is where Luther ultimately lands uh, and a lot of this theology is like, oh, shit. Like, yeah, I can't do this all on my own. And that's impossible. Um, and right, which leads to a lot of, like, um, when he starts to dive into things is when he kind of really comes around to realize. He's like, oh, we're, we're doing yeah. this wrong. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but the Catholic Church really still likes their rules, so. Well, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> we do, too. Um, I mean, you know, like, it's, uh, this is the problem with human institutions. Um, right. They're made up of humans. And to recognize that for every single <laughs> Every one. single thing, right? And so the church is not perfect. It's messed up. Um, uh, uh, you know, and cultures are obviously very different, and so I think it's important to take cultural context in. Like, when you were talking about um, the $500 suits before, right? Like, obviously, yes, I did not get into this gig for the $500 suits. That is not my understanding. <laughs> no, I said shoes. Oh, well, oh. Well, well the suits were way more I mean, $500. Maybe I did get into it for the $500 shoes. <laughs> um, that'd be nice. But, but again, to be born again, it's super interesting because I think, um, all right, so I kind of think that Paul... Uh, St. Paul was really um, into quantum physics, um, even though that wasn't really a thing yet. Uh, I say this in the sense that a big part of Paul's theology was that when we are baptized, we actually go out of time and space, <laughs> and we are co-crucified with Jesus on the cross, and then we come back from that, you know, time traveling. Um, uh, so many time traveling babies. Uh, <laughs> but we come back from that um, as new creations. We are new, and that's what happens in the act of baptism is our old self has died, it's gone away, and we are suddenly this new thing. Um, and, and so, I mean, I do kind of like nerd out about the quantum, you know, mechanics of everything, but, um, but even if you just want to talk about like, what does this look like for us mm -hmm. in the here and now? What would it actually mean to be born anew, born again? Um, uh, and uh, so, with Luther's understanding, we are to die to sin every single day and be born anew in Christ. Right? I mean, so this born again thing was like a daily thing for Luther. Every day was a new life, a new chance, a new opportunity. Um, 
And I mean, again, let's get gay. Um, if you want to talk about um, this, I think this is another huge gift from queer theology. Um, <laughs> there's actually the, the LGBTQ Lutheran um, uh, community at University of Maryland, shout out, uh, is called Reborn This Way. Yeah! <laughs> right? Um, uh, which, kind of a coming out story. Yeah, right? Yeah. And I love it because it's, you know, um, Gaga, right, has taught us that, uh, you know, we've always been born this way, but I think what happens when we come out, it's almost like being born anew, right? Yeah, like it is. Even though this is who we've always been, yeah. we now get to be this full thing, this new person, um, because of what God has done for us. Yeah. Uh, this is the liberating power of this passage for me, is that uh, it's not like all of a sudden you're some you know, creature that you had never been before. You're still you. You've always been you. You've always been born this way. But in this process of kind of coming out, yeah. um, you get new life. Mm -hmm. That's the kingdom for me, right? This is new life. This is everlasting life for me. So um, I preached once um, the, the coming out of, of Moses. Yeah. Like when Moses actually, like, finally, um, you know, kind of came out as a Hebrew, right? Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. He'd always been Hebrew. He was right. born a Hebrew, yeah. a Hebrew baby, but he was raised by Egyptians. And so right. there was that, that, that moment where, like, he sort of came out and finally acknowledged that, like, this is who he is, that, yeah. that he is a Hebrew and he needs to, to be a Hebrew. Yeah, yeah. This is the most this coming out story. Right, and so this is the work of the Spirit, in my understanding, mm -hmm. right? Like, when we have this vision of, um, you know, the curtain being torn at the crucifixion, it's like... Messiah's on the loose, right? You know, uh, it's like that's like the coming out is that like uh, God, you know, in the Holy of Holies, and now God is also everywhere, and yet we understand that God has always kind of been everywhere. But yeah. sometimes we need these visual acts um, and these these kind of frameworks, like what we've been given and what Nicodemus was given, to be able to kind of access it, to go through it, to understand it. So it's not so much that I think that. Um, you know, like, uh, you you cease to exist, and all of a sudden you're this whole thing. But I think in a way, when the spirit moves as she will, as she will, um, right, it's almost like this curtain is being torn. This veil is being pulled back. Um, and we're getting to be who we've always been. And how liberating is that? Yeah. You know? Um, so I, that's one of the parts that brings me joy about this. For me, it's not a gatekeeping. It's, it's God's gift of yeah. liberating you to be you. It's an opportunity, right? This is, for me, this is my, how I read this text, is that God came to the world not to judge us, not to force us into this box that we have to be, you know, automatons that are like, you know, Jesus robots that are doing the right things, saying the right things. God came for freedom um, so that we could be us. Uh, and that's really beautiful for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for some light reading, you should read A Freedom of a Christian by Martin Luther. I mean, you should. It's, <laughs> you know, casually as one does. Uh, read a little Luther on this side. Um, but, yeah, I, and I will also encourage, like, there are um, tons of different kind of liberation theologies, right? So, like, mm -hmm. I've kind of focused on... Chris, explain to us what liberation theology is. I would be happy Thank to! You. Yes, um, so I've been focusing a little bit on queer liberation theology just because... That's part of my identity, and so that it makes sense to me. It's a framework and a lens that makes sense to me. Um, uh, but so liberation theologies usually um, uh, have been formed around um, certain communities, identities, uh, and they um, are uh, oftentimes communities or identities that have been oppressed, um, uh, that have been pushed aside, that have been erased. Um, and uh, so uh, one of the earlier ones was Latin American liberation theology. Um, and so there was this understanding that came out uh, in these readings that God has come into the world for to seek out specifically those people who have been hurt, harmed, pushed aside, those who have been gate kept, if you will, yeah. uh, right, um, by those who have kind of put themselves in the center, uh, and to say that God is there for them. Because when we're reading these Jesus narratives, we see that time and time and time again. This is where Jesus goes. Jesus goes out, mm -hmm. you know. Um, in this instance, I think it's interesting because we see an instance of a person in power coming Someone in. in the middle. Yeah, right? Um, uh, uh, and so even though it looks like he's, uh, that like Nicodemus is coming in, in a way, Nicodemus is going oh, yeah. to out, mm -hmm. right? 
Nicodemus is coming out. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, so, yeah, so the, the liberation theologies have, um, again, this isn't like trying to like create something that's not there. Mm -hmm. It's an idea of taking scriptures um, and taking theologies uh, with a certain lens or framework, right? Using the gifts that these different identities and communities have to kind of free the text, if you will, to liberate them from just this one way of reading yeah. it, interpreting it, understanding it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, another reason why I love that we have this text, because I do think that 316 needs to be liberated in a way, right? Like, um, uh, because when you just have it in this one nice, neat package of a verse, it's not that it's wrong in and of itself, but there's so much more going on around it. And that's important. <laughs> it makes a difference yeah. uh, to understand it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think it's just, uh, the whole thing is all liberation for yeah. me. Very much so. Liberating. Um, also, there's another word for coming out, really. I'm getting out, getting out of the box. It's freedom. But, yeah. yeah. So hopefully we were able to um, liberate John three sixteen for you, or, <laughs> or at least just intrigue you a little yeah, bit uh, yeah. to learn about some other um, biblical perspectives. Thank you, Chris, for for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, but that's gonna be all for today. Um, and thanks for joining us. Hopefully uh, we'll catch you next week on Tuesday on Shit They Don't Tell You on Sunday. As always, follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash shit they don't tell you on Sunday. Um, and subscribe wherever it is that you listen to podcasts to stay at with us. As well as you can also um, subscribe on YouTube if you want to see Chris and I's faces and all of our beautiful hand, hand gestures. gestures. <laughs> uh, we're both very uh, it's true. handsy yeah. people. We're hand talkers. Um, <laughs> and so if you really like that video, you should go and subscribe on YouTube. Same. Should they don't tell you on Sunday, you can find all of those links on the Facebook page. Well, um, share this with family and friends that you think might want to journey with us and learn a little bit more. Um, and we'll catch you next time. Take care, everyone.